Well, hello, this is Mike Howard, and I'm here with... Bev Howard. And we're in the dining room about to do another Bible <laughs> study lesson in Yay. the book of Luke. And we're getting close to the end of our uh, sessions on Luke. This is uh, the 11th, and uh, 12th and 13th will be the final two lessons. And then we'll go on to the book of Job and mm -hmm. Ecclesiastes. Uh, those are difficult books. Mm. If you think about um, uh, getting uh, knowledge about the Lord... Uh, undergraduate stuff you can think of in terms of uh, the Gospels and uh, <clears throat> in the Psalms and then you get into more of a graduate work into the Proverbs and mm -hmm. and uh, but then when you think about getting your PhD and understanding uh, the <laughs> Lord uh, it's the book of Job Ooh. and the book of Ecclesiastes those are those are really tough stuff mm -hmm. but we're gonna we're gonna nugget out the truth in those two books in a few weeks but first of all, this lesson is about the crucifixion. Mm -hmm. And I know if you're a Christian, a, a church-going Christian, you've heard a ton of sermons about the crucifixion. And if you're a moviegoer, you've seen The Passion of Christ and other movies about the crucifixion of Christ, the, the greatest story ever told, et cetera, et cetera. But today we're going to see it in a slightly different light. The Holy Spirit, I believe, has... Uh, given me a little bit of a different slant on how this story is told because Luke tells it a little different than the other three Gospels. Let's do a little background before we get started with today's lesson. First of all, if you'll remember the last few weeks, Jesus uh, had, had, uh, he had celebrated the Passover dinner, the Seder dinner, with his disciples in the upper room, and they had uh, finished that up by singing Psalm 118, which is a real prophetic song, uh, psalm about uh, his death. And then they go through the valley and back up uh, on the Mount of Olives and they go to the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, which is uh, where Jesus prays uh, three times for uh, the Lord to the God to take the cup away from him, cup being the crucifixion uh, away from him. But he said uh, in each one of those prayers, uh, I would rather your will uh, be done. And so uh, we know that this is God's will, that Jesus would die on the cross for us. And so and Jesus got, got real clarification, not that he wasn't clear before, but he got clarification for not only himself, but for us, that this was the right way, that this was the only way that God was going to be able to save you and save me. Uh, so he's arrested then, uh, in, at, towards the end of that, uh, those prayers, he's arrested uh, Judas betrays him, and he's uh, accused uh, by the high priest and the other leaders of the Sanhedrin of blasphemy, of uh, believing or saying that he is the Son of God, and they believed that he wasn't, therefore it was blasphemy to, uh, to claim that you were the Son of God. He was tried that next morning, uh, uh, Friday morning, uh, as the sun came up, he was tried, convicted, and then sentenced by the Sanhedrin to death. The problem was they were, they, the Sanhedrin was not permitted by the Romans to kill anybody. So even though they tried him, convicted him and sentenced him, they couldn't do anything about it. So they turned Jesus over to Herod uh, and to Pilate, the two go Roman governors, uh, to be sentenced to die. And uh, Pilate uh, interviewed Jesus, couldn't find anything wrong with him, told the Jewish leaders, I can't find anything that this man has done. And they said, oh, but he's violated our law. He's blasphemed. Uh, and so Pilate said, okay, fine, I'll give you Jesus or I'll give you Barabbas. And, he, and they, they said, oh, give us Barabbas instead of Jesus. So he said, okay, then my hands are clean. I, I said, he's innocent. So he turns him, uh, Pilate turns uh, Jesus over to the soldiers. They beat him and then they mock him. And by mocking him, they put a, a royal robe on him. They put a crown of thorns on his head. They took a staff, a stick, and they, they beat him. Uh, they, uh, they really thrashed him pretty badly. Uh, uh, we've seen those movies. We, we've understood uh, how deeply those wounds uh, scarred him, how bloody he was, how weak he was. And then he needed help to even carry his cross up to Golgotha or the, to the place where he was crucified. And then Jesus is taken to be crucified. And that's where we pick up the story in today's lesson. He's actually on the journey after being beaten and mocked and shamed and spit on. Uh, he is now on his way up to the uh, cross, uh, to where he's going to be crucified. We're going to start in Luke chapter 23, verse 33. When they came to the place called the Skull, uh, which is Golgotha, they crucified him there. Now, if you look in the other three Gospels, 
Each one of those three gospels does not elaborate on this. They simply say, this is where they crucified him. And the word crucify means to, uh, to uh, 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 kill on a cross, to kill on a cross. So there he, the, he was killed on a cross. Is, is, that's the translation of they crucified him there. And, but it, it gives a little bit more detail. All four Gospels say, along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. So we see Jesus in the middle, and there'll be just common thieves were on both his left and his right-hand side. And that's going to play an important part of this story in just a little bit. And Jesus said his first prayer was, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. And we're going to come back to that prayer too, because that was a very, very powerful prayer. And it held God's judgment, his wrath back from those people for a long time, for actually for 40 years. He says, they don't know what they're doing. And then the soldiers divided up Jesus's clothes by casting lots. And that was prophesied in Psalm 22. The people stood watching and there was a giant crowd there. This was Passover. There were hundreds of thousands of people gathered in Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. So there was a giant crowd of people watching this crucifixion. And then he says there are three groups that he calls out specifically, Luke calls out specifically. First of all, the rulers, they were sneering at Jesus. They said, if he saved, now this is interesting. Listen to what each one of these three groups says about Jesus or says to Jesus. The people stood watching, the rulers even sneered at him. They said, if he saved others, so they know about his, his ministry, they know how he raised people from the dead, they know how he healed the blind, healed the lepers, they know all of these things. He saved others, let him save himself. If he is God's Messiah, the chosen one. Then the soldiers also came and mocked him. Now they've already dressed him in a royal robe and they've already put a crown on his head of thorns and they've already, um, and even Pilate put a sign on top of the cross, you know, Jesus, King of the Jews. And so they have mocked him already, but now they're gonna mock him even more. They offered him wine vinegar and they said, which is a, a little bit of a, a kind of a, 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 a a way to kill to take the edge off the pain and they, and said and would buy, he tasted it and he said no I don't want that he says if you are the king of the Jews save yourself let me go back let him save himself that's the rulers the next is a group of soldiers and they say the same thing you if you are the king of the Jews save yourself we're beginning to see why Jesus had to pray three times, Father, take this cup from me, but not my will, but your will be done, because he was very capable of getting off the cross. Mm -hmm. And if he hadn't prayed those prayers and committed this to God, he may have been tempted to save himself, take mm -hmm. himself off the cross. So he said, that's the second group, and that would be the soldiers. Mm -hmm. If you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. And then there's a third group. There was a written notice above him which read, this is the king of the Jews. Now that was kind of interesting because when Pilate said, put a sign over his head, this is the king of the Jews, he put it in three different languages. The Jewish leader said, no, 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 no. We don't want the sign to say this is the king of the Jews. If you're gonna put something up there, put he said he was king of the Jews. And Pilate answered back, he said, I, what I wrote, I wrote. What is written is written. <laughs> I mean, that's gonna be the sign. And he was, Pilate was basically mocking the Jewish leaders. So one of the criminals hung there, hurled insults at him. And, and we see in one of the other gospels that at least when they both started out, both of these criminals were hurling insults at him. But one of these thieves has a change of heart. So it's one of the criminals who hung there, hurled insults at Jesus. And he said to him, if you're the, aren't you the Messiah? So both of these thieves knew about Jesus. We're going to find out. And this one says, aren't you the Messiah? In other words, we've heard all about you. You're really famous. You've done a lot of miraculous things. Aren't you the Messiah? And then he says, save yourself. And oh, by the way, he throws in, save us. Because we're hanging up here with you, okay? So we've got three groups. We've got the Jewish leaders. We've got the soldiers. And now we've got this thief who's basically saying the same thing. If you are the Messiah, save yourself. Mm. And that kind of sets up the whole process here that we understand that everybody is telling Jesus, if you're the Messiah, you're gonna save yourself. When indeed, and in fact, since he is the Messiah, he 
sacrifices himself mm -hmm. to save everyone else. Mm -hmm. So there's a little bit of irony there. We'll go through that and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Now, I, I remember the lesson where Peter was denying Jesus three times. And I thought to myself, you know, if I'm writing the story of Jesus and the crucifixion, I'm just going to make Jesus the center stage person right. in this story. And all the other people are just kind of bit players. But God does not see that this way. Mm -hmm. He sees it as we are all the reason that Jesus goes to the cross. Mm -hmm. And he, he invokes Peter's denials as part of that process. And now he's about to invoke the story of a common thief as part of the sacrifice, uh, the, as part of the uh, crucifixion story. Mm -hmm. So the criminal rebuked the other criminal. You can see them leaning across looking at each other. He says, no, don't you fear God, he says, since you and I are under the same sentence, we are punished justly because we're getting what our deeds deserve. We are common criminals and because of that, we deserve to die here on these crosses because we're criminals. But this man, he's talking about Jesus, hasn't done anything wrong. And then he says to Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And this shows that this thief has a really unbelievably clear understanding about who Jesus is. As a matter of fact, he's the only one in this whole list of people who seems to get it. Mm -hmm. And you think to yourself, how is that even possible that this common thief, all of a sudden, by the way, he starts out mocking Jesus and all of a sudden he has this unbelievable epiphany about who Jesus is and about who he is and about God's wrath. It's just a miraculous story. We read about all these stories where Jesus heals the blind and the deaf and the lame and the lepers. And we think, wow, those are some unbelievable miracles. He gave sight to the blind. What Jesus has just done to this thief or for this thief is he has given eternal sight mm. to a spiritually blind thief. That's cool. And that is just as big a miracle as any miracle that he ever did. It's as big a miracle as raising Lazarus from the dead because he gives this condemned man who is literally on his deathbed of a cross eternal life. He says, uh, Jesus answered him in verse 43, I'm telling you the truth. And the reason he says I'm telling you the truth is because the thief is like, you know, this you're my last chance. And Jesus says, you need to understand. I'm telling you the truth today, not tomorrow, today. You're going to be with me in paradise. And paradise is a, an old, old ancient Phoenician word that means garden. And the Jews used it synonymously with the word heaven or where God lives. So he says, truly I'm telling you today, you will be with me in paradise. Wow. It was now about noon, so that conversation finished about noon, and all of a sudden, the sun grew dark, mm. and darkness overcame the whole land until about three in the afternoon, for the sun had stopped shining, and the curtain in the temple, the division between God's presence and the people was torn in two. Nothing now separates the presence of God from the people from humans. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And we, when he had said that, he breathed his last. So Jesus is now passed from an earthly physical life into the next life, which is now Jesus is a spirit. He has commended his spirit, his soul, into the hands of God the Father. And he leaves his body behind to be buried in the tomb. So let's take a look at the irony of the cross. And ironies, uh, they're interesting, but let's look at, I think, six ironies. One is the one who couldn't save himself, or the one who didn't save himself, he could have, he died to save 
other people. Mm -hmm. So that's ironic. Everybody's telling him, Jesus, save yourself. If you're the Messiah, save yourself. And the one who could have actually saved himself decided that he would die instead so that other people could be saved. So that was a giant irony. It was completely lost on everybody. Even the disciples couldn't figure this one out. The one who was accused of blasphemy was killed by the Jewish leaders who were blaspheming the Son of God. The third irony is the innocent person is killed by the guilty people. The fourth irony is Jesus is cursed by one who loves him, by God his Father, so that those who hate him can be saved. Now, let me reread that one. God has chosen to curse his son on the cross. The one who hangs on the tree is cursed so that those who hate him, and, G and God loves Jesus. This is my son in whom I love and where I'm well pleased. He chose to curse his son who loved him to save the ones who hated him. And Jesus goes from life to death so that we can go from death to life. Mm -hmm. Jesus is killed for disturbing the Passover celebration. That's probably the most ironic of them all because the Passover was celebrating the spirit of God's vengeance passing over those whose doors were covered with the blood of the innocent lamb. So Jesus, the lamb of Passover, is killed because he was disturbing the Jewish people's Passover celebration. Hmm. How ironic is that? So let's talk about exactly what just happened in this story because I think it's absolutely crucial to the understanding of where we are today, you and I. First of all, nobody understood. There was no clarity, there was no vision, there was no understanding of what and why this cross sacrifice was happening. The Jewish leaders didn't understand it. The Roman leaders could not understand it. The Jewish people who were shouting, Barabbas, Barabbas, crucify him, crucify him, they didn't understand it. The soldiers who mocked him and put a crown of thorn on his, heads, on his head and beat him with a staff, they didn't understand. The apostles, they all scattered. They didn't fully understand. The disciples, they didn't understand it either. Let me be real clear. There's not a person at this particular point in time who understands what God and Jesus are doing. Nobody. Nobody fully understands it. Peter doesn't understand it. Nobody understands it. Zero people understand it. Let me make sure that point gets clear. At this point, when Jesus is dying on the cross, nobody Nobody, nobody understands what this is all about. It's completely hidden from everybody. I know I'm being melodramatic here <laughs> and overly dramatic, but trust me, nobody, zero people understand what this is all about. God has hidden it from everybody, but he's about to show it to somebody. There were so many clues. Looking back on it, I don't know about you, but anytime I do something really, really stupid, it kind of sneaks up on me. Later on, I do the whole Monday morning quarterback and go, well, I should have seen that coming. I should have known when I did this, that was going to cause that, and then that was going to cause this other thing. I should have seen that coming. Boy, am I stupid. I should have seen all of that coming. And there was a lot of Monday morning quarterbacking after this because when Adam and Eve figured out they were naked and needed to be covered. They tried to create a covering of leaves and God said, that's not gonna be a sufficient covering. I'm going to have to kill an animal and take a skin because only blood can cover sin. So that was the first clue that we had. Abraham was told by God, take Isaac up and sacrifice your only son. And then God provided the lamb 
in the thicket with a crown of thorns. We should have seen that one. The whole sacrificial system, scapegoat. You remember those? The sacrifice for sin. Every single year, there was a sacrifice for for the sin of the, of the nation. And then if you sinned, you would take an animal and have it sacrificed by the priest for your sin, sin sacrifice. There was prophecy. If you were a student of the Old Testament, you could read Psalm 22, where God says about Jesus that he is going to be, uh, he's going to be pierced for our transgressions, okay? Isaiah 53 says the same thing even to the point that the soldiers are gonna cast lots for his clothes. And then if that's not enough, if you've been with Jesus for three and a half years, you probably can't even count how many times he has explained that he must go to Jerusalem and die and then come back to life, be resurrected. Mm -hmm. So all of those clues, all of those clues are available to the Jewish leaders. They're all available to the disciples, the apostles, and yet nobody Nobody, nobody, nobody understands until one finally did. My daughter-in-law, uh, Ellen, laughs. She gets, has gotten a big kick out of these lessons in Luke because we always talk about in these lessons that the prostitutes and the tax collectors, and in this case, the thieves, all know that they need a savior. And she's, she's just gotten a big kick out of that because we're always talking about prostitutes and tax collectors and thieves. <laughs> and in this particular case, we're talking about a thief. And who, and who is the first? Is that one of the apostles, one of the disciples, one of the Jewish leaders? Who's the first? Who's the very first person to understand what's going on on the cross. It's a thief. It's a thief. So how did, what did he understand? First of all, he understood that God's wrath was coming on him. And quite frankly, God's wrath is coming on everybody. Verse 40, but the other criminal rebuked him don't you fear God? Don't you understand that we are not only going to get crucified on this cross, but we're going to be eternally judged by the God who created the universe because we have fallen short in the area of keeping the law. We have sinned. And he says, don't you fear God? And in uh, Proverbs, it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Mm -hmm. So the first step, the first step that the thief took was he understood his condition. Not only was he hung on a cross by the Romans for stealing and other petty crimes, but he was also about to go in front of God and he understood that he was not going to have a pleasant experience because God's wrath against sin was going to be a terrible, terrible thing, and it's something to be feared. Which brings up the whole point of Passover. See, the Jews were celebrating Passover because they believed that it was the final miracle that God did so that Pharaoh would release them from slavery. But if you look deeper, what God was doing with Passover was because of the shed blood of the innocent lamb, God's wrath was actually going to pass over the Israelites. So Passover wasn't about getting out of Egypt. Passover was about getting out from under God's wrath. That's what Passover was really all about. Now, it resulted in them being freed from sin or from Egypt, which represents the world, but what it was about was being passed over by God's wrath. And the first thing that this, this thief said was, don't you fear God? Don't you understand the wrath that we deserve? The wrath of God's coming, the blood of Passover is your only hope. The second thing that the thief said is that we deserve what we're getting. We deserve death. 
He said, since you and I are under the same sentence, we are punished justly for we're getting what our deeds have earned us. We're getting what we deserve. First thing he said was, don't you fear the wrath of God? Second thing he says is, we are actually getting exactly what we deserve. The third thing he says is, but Jesus, the one next to us, the one in the middle between us, he hasn't done anything wrong. He's actually dying as an innocent man who's done nothing wrong. 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Number four, Jesus is the Messiah and my Savior. First thing he said was, don't you, fear, don't you have a fear of God's wrath? Second thing he said was, come on, we deserve what we're getting. Third thing he said is, this man Jesus has done nothing wrong. He is a spotless lamb, is dying for no reason of his own. The fourth thing he says is, Jesus is the Messiah and he is my hopeful savior. And then he said to Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus's prayer at the beginning of all this was, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. They're blind, they have no understanding. And now he's saying at this point, I've been forgiven, so please remember me when I come into your kingdom. And Jesus's response is the same response he gives to you and me when we understand those four things. Truly, I wanna tell you, you will be with me in the garden with God in paradise the garden of God where you will find the tree of life. In Revelation 2, 7, the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Mm -hmm. The paradise, the garden of God. The thief was the first. Jesus was within three hours of dying and the light of revelation of who he was and what was going on was first revealed, was first revealed, was first revealed to the person next to him on the cross. He was the first to actually see what this was all about. And then later it was revealed completely. The disciples finally got it after the resurrection. And then Peter preached at Pentecost, get out of here now. <laughs> Get away from me, Satan. Mm -hmm. Peter preached to the 3,000 that were saved at Pentecost. Then there were, the Bible says, many priests and leaders believed. Many in Judea, Laodicea, and, and Samaria. And then down through the ages, you and I can make the exact same mm -hmm. confession. But I want to talk with the last thing. The last thing I want to say is the powerful prayer for forgiveness. Jesus prayed in verse 34, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Let me tell you the power of that prayer. If you were God, the second that Jesus died, if I had been God, I would have destroyed Jerusalem. I would have ripped it to shreds. I would have, the earthquake would have left no stone on top of another stone. The wrath, my wrath would have instantly fried everybody there that had killed my son. Mm -hmm. But Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they do. For 40 years, this was AD 30 that this happened. For 40 years, for an entire generation, for everybody that was an adult, at the time of his prayer, God held back his wrath and gave them an opportunity to receive Jesus as their Savior. It wasn't until AD 70, until that next generation, that God's wrath struck Jerusalem. That's the power of the prayer of Jesus. That same prayer was, was prayed by Stephen, who was a, a leader in the early church. He was an early deacon. And Stephen, as they were stoning him to death, he says, Father, do not hold this sin against them. And what was the power of Stephen's prayer? Do you remember there was a person standing there and they put their coats at this person's feet while they were stoning Stephen. And that person was Paul. And Paul got the light. Mm -hmm. On the road to Damascus, Jesus gave him that light to understand who he was. Mm -hmm. 
That's a powerful prayer. So where does that prayer fit in your life and in my life? Yes. We find it in 1 Peter 2, 21 and 23. <clears throat> to this prayer, you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. Yes. Yeah. The most powerful prayer that we can pray for those mm -hmm. who are against God and against Christ is, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. And the second prayer that we can pray is, Holy Spirit, show them that they are no better and the prostitutes and the tax collectors and this thief. And when they see that, they'll turn and they'll make those confessions and they'll see Jesus as their savior. And Jesus will say, this very day, you will be with me in the garden with God. And you'll eat from the tree of life. Pray with me. Father God, even on the cross, Jesus is performing miracles. And this, the most important miracle of his life, and that is to give sight to a blind, spiritually a blind man. And he gives that sight through the Holy Spirit to those that he chooses down through the ages. So Father God, thank you for the cross. Thank you for his sacrifice. Thank you for his death. Thank you for his life when he came back and was resurrected. But Father, thank you for this thief that he was the first mm -hmm. to see what was going on. Mm -hmm. And because of that, he's there with Jesus today. Mm -hmm. Father, thank you for your Holy Spirit that reveals who you are to us and our sinful condition and the fact that we need you as our Savior. So Father, we pray for our friends who don't know. We pray for our friends who don't have a clue. We pray for our friends who persecute you, that first of all, that you will forgive them because they really, truly don't have a clue what they're doing. And second prayer is, Father, oh, Father, we beg, we plead that you would convict them, that you would show them, you would open their eyes so that they could see their need for Jesus. Yes. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. That's the story of the cross and the story of the first man who understood it. Mm -hmm. I hope to see you soon. Until then, come on back next week. We'll do lesson number 12. <laughs> we love you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Bye. Bye.